Aren't you guys tired of covering this? Aren't you guys tired of being here and having to cover all of these mass shootings? I'm from Highland Park, Illinois. My son and I survived a mass shooting over the summer. I am in Tennessee on a family vacation with my son visiting my sister-in-law. I have been lobbying in D.C. since we survived a mass shooting in July. I have met with over 130 lawmakers. How is this still happening? How are our children still dying and why are we failing them? That is a mother speaking out after a press conference on the shooting at a Christian elementary school in Nashville that killed three children and three adults. Thanks for being here at 6 a.m. everyone. I'm Eric Connert. And I'm Nettie Irampour. And this morning, police in Nashville, they're looking into the background and the motivations of the woman who opened fire. Officers shot and killed her. CBS 8's Chris Grove joining us live in studio here with the latest on this investigation, including what we are learning about the victims here, Chris. And I think it's human nature, obviously, that we want to know why. Why, why did something happen like this? And that, of course, will be up to the police to try to figure that out. In fact, we're still again waiting to know more about the motive why would someone again a former student of this school enter with multiple guns and open fire but in the meantime we are learning more about the victims and the shooter and at this hour we now know their names the children each nine years old identified as Evelyn Dykehouse, Hallie Scruggs and William Kinney the adults custodian Mike Hill substitute teacher Cynthia Peak and the head of the school Catherine Kuntz according to law enforcement this was a planned attack the shooter, identified as Audrey Hale, a 28-year-old, was again a former student. We're told by police that she shot through the side doors to gain entrance. Hale had three weapons, an assault-style rifle, an assault-style pistol, and a handgun. It's believed by police that those two, that at least two of those, I should say, were purchased legally. Police have also added that Hale had a detailed map to point out the school surveillance system and blind spots. More guns were found at Hale's home as well as other evidence. But let's take a listen to what some residents in the nearby area had to say in the aftermath of the shooting. I'm just so sad and heartbroken for the families that are impacted by this um, and their, their children. It's just heartbreaking to see it actually happen right here in our hometown. And yesterday, in response to the shooting, President Biden called again on Congress to enact an assault weapons ban. According to the CDC, guns are the leading cause of death amongst children in the country. Flags at the White House were ordered at half staff to honor the victims. Eric. All right, Chris, thanks for that. New this morning, 39 people are dead after a fire at an immigration detention center in Mexico. 29 others were hurt in this. This happened last night in the border city of Ciudad Juarez near El Paso. According to Reuters, over 60 people from Central and South America were staying at this facility. No word, though, on what caused this fire. And now this morning, the father of an infant who was found with severe injuries and later died is behind bars. 37-year-old Jaime Javier Santillanes is pleading not guilty to murder charges. He was arrested Wednesday, the day after officers found his seven-week-old daughter badly hurt. This was at a townhome in University City. She died three days later in the hospital. And we have a really sad update here. Police are now confirming a UC San Diego neuroscientist who went missing in Montreal, Canada, has died. 31-year-old Ann Wu was one of seven people killed in a building fire. She was there in Montreal to attend an academic conference. She was staying at what was an Airbnb. She was reported missing after a fire in the building that she was staying in. That fire was on March 16th. It took some, took some time for fire crews to go back in, identify the victims. Her colleagues described her as creative, fearless, and forward-thinking. No word yet on what caused the fire. Today, Governor Gavin Newsom is expected to sign a bill into law that would allow California to penalize oil companies for price gouging. You can see here today's price creeping closer to $5 right now, $4.87 a gallon. CBS 8's Dana Marie McNichol is live in Kearney Mason now with the latest on this bill. Dana Marie. Well, good morning, Eric. I mean, some places in Kearney Mesa are above $5, and we spent the last year talking to so many of our viewers about how high gas prices has really impacted them. So this new bill signed into law could potentially bring them down at a time when we've seen continuously high prices. So I'm going to break down what this means. So under the bill, the California Energy Commission will have the power to collect data from oil refineries and then find them if they're making too much profit off California drivers. The 
Democrats in charge of the state legislature worked quickly to pass the bill on Monday, just one week after it was introduced. It was unusually fast for a controversial issue. California's gas prices are always higher than the rest of the country because of the state's taxes and regulations. California has the second highest gas tax in the country at 54 cents per gallon. But state regulators say those taxes and fees aren't enough to explain last summer when the average cost of a gallon in California was more than $2.60 higher than the national average. Democrats pointed out that the main focus of the bill is getting information from big oil companies. The penalty is optional, not required. They say it doesn't require any maximum profit caps. It requires information to understand how we arrive at the gas prices, so greed and price gouging is not part of the equation. Some Republicans, like Assemblymember Vince Fong, said his district represents 70 percent of the state's full sector. He's worried about the impacts and doesn't believe in the timeline which the bill was passed. You got a week. What kind of process is that? So part of what I'm saying today is, man, stand up for yourself. Stand up for the legislator that you are, that you were elected to be, and say, no, this is our process. We make policy. Governor, thank you for your ideas. We'll take those into consideration, but we'll make the policy. And that measure was passed by a vote 54 to 19, so there really was some substantial support behind this. If you'd like to read more details, CBSA.com is a great reference. I'm Dana Marie McNichol coming to you live from Kearney Mesa. Dan Ray, thank you. And this morning, a local lawmaker will share more details on his proposal to ban homeless encampments near certain community areas. State Senate Minority Leader Brian Jones from Santee wants to ban them near schools, daycare centers, parks, and libraries. Some homeless advocates argue this does not solve the underlying issues of homelessness. Coming up here later this hour, we're going to discuss the crisis live with San Diego Police Chief David Nislight. 607 now. Let's check in with Evan. Evan, it was so nice yesterday. I'd love a repeat. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get it for today. It's going to be just a hair cooler compared to yesterday. So we hang on to the relatively warm temperatures. Yesterday was the first day, or the, I should say the second day, actually, first day of the week, but second day in the month of March where we made it into above average territory. We hit a high yesterday in downtown San Diego of 70 degrees. Today, we are not expected to hit 70. We'll only be a few degrees off of it, but the place to celebrate is going to be across the mountains and deserts where uh, those locations climb by about 10 to 15 degrees compared to yesterday. They're going to get their warmth today. Countywide, we've got sunshine on hand. Inland will make it to the upper 60s, a couple low 70s for areas like El Cajon and Santee. And you can see how it was really just yesterday and then the previous Saturday, not this past Saturday, but the Saturday before where we made it to 76 degrees. And those are the two days in the month of March where we made it to above average territory and made it over 70. But we're gearing up for this next storm. It's going to make its way south along the west coast and then it hits us tomorrow just around the 11 a.m. hour, so closer to the late late morning, early afternoon time frame. Uh, it will start off with a decent band of showers and then things become a little bit more scattered in nature throughout the rest of your Wednesday night and Thursday. Snow levels are going to drop down from 6,500 feet down to just 3,500 feet and that continues all the way through about your Thursday afternoon before those showers taper off by nightfall. In terms of your totals, well, they've changed a bit. We're looking at about three quarters of an inch as our highest probability and then across your inland valleys, we are expecting up to an inch total and then you see how another trough of low pressure is going to start to sink in giving us a small chance of wet weather not as impactful but still in the forecast as we go into our Monday. This includes some snow over the mountaintops four to six inches for Palomar Mountain trace amounts for Julian one to two inches for Mount Laguna. Afternoon highs are going to be in the 60s but here's where we are right now mostly 40s got some 50s along the coast. Let's take a look at traffic as we head out the door. A couple crashes that we want to start off with one that is on the 805. This has been up on the screen for about an hour or so. It is the 805 crash at the 15. Looks like that is the still the only thing to mention to start off the morning. I believe that is still just a right lane. Yeah, right hand shoulder blocked there with the crash on the 805 at the 15. Back to you.